So back in October, we actually started out kind of a, an expository lesson in the book of Revelation. We've gotten through the first five chapters, and we took a break to do a series on uh, rediscovering Christmas, because this year Christmas has been totally, hasn't, hasn't been, was, you know, totally different. When you see a lot of posts on Facebook and everything, you know, people saying, well, uh, for Christmas we used to go here, we used to go there, and, and everything that would happen, and they would be with family and family, and this year it, it was like when we were opening our presents, uh, my son and, and uh, my daughter-in-law are out in uh, Arizona, and so as we're getting together, together to open our presents, we, we got a, a portal, uh, and so we actually kind of did like a Zoom off of our portal with my, my, my son and my daughter-in-law, and, and everybody there kind of together just, just kind of sharing. And then as Jason was singing this song, I, I got a, a call this weekend uh, my mom is 91. Uh, she has d- dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, has been in a, a long-term care facility now uh, for almost a year. And as she was uh, actually put in there last fall, and, and then when everything hit in February, it was like it just got shut down. Uh, you visits were on the outside you couldn't go in you couldn't see in anything and and so um i got a call from my sister because she has the medical power of attorney for my mom and they're getting ready to do the the uh they call the vaccine shot you know which which isn't a vaccine but that's neither here nor there it's just semantics um and, and so she was trying to get some input from all of my brothers and sisters saying, okay, what are you going to do? What are we going to do with mom? She's 91. We really don't know how this is going to affect everybody. We haven't seen, you know, the long-term effects. She's doing okay physically and everything and, and saying, you know, well, what if she goes to die? And, and we were talking, and it's basically, well, you know, uh, if you look, a lot of times obituaries would always read that someone would die with, surrounded by their family. But unfortunately, you don't see a lot of those uh, in the newspapers today because a lot of people who are in facilities and hospitals, they're dying alone. Their families aren't there to hold their hand, to share with them and telling them it's okay. It's all right. Go ahead, go home. And you, the loneliness, you know, the uncertainty of dying anyway and the loneliness of it, and, and you're sitting there trying to decide and, you know, left and right. And so we were, we were still Facebooking back and forth uh, all night and saying, you know, well, what about this or what about that? And, and I just said, you know, here's my opinion, you know, and, um, you, you know, uh, whatever you want to decide, I'll just give you my two cents and we'll, we'll just, you know, just go from there. I said, because uh, I've enjoyed my mom for the 91 years and that, that God has given. Uh, and uh, when she's gone, hey, I'll, I'll cry. You know, I'll get emotional. But I also know that it won't be long before I come and see her. Which brings us as to why am I saying this? Because one of the things that you need to realize, and, and as we come into Revelation chapter 6, I, I know it's a very controversial and, and, and everything else of a whole book and so many different ideas and stuff, but you need to understand that when, you, when we got from chapter 3 through chapter 3 and we come into chapter 4, John gets a picture of the th- in the throne room of God. It's an awesome sight. He, he's there and he's viewing all of this and, and he gets to see the lion and the lamb and God. He gets to see the parchment and all of the things, you, you know, were there. And, and, and so 
all of a sudden we come from four and five where he begins to see the magnificence of God and we come into chapter six. And in chapter six, you need to understand something. Number one, John has not left heaven. He is still in heaven, but he's getting to see a picture of what's going to unfold on the earth. He's getting to see the picture from God's viewpoint and got Jesus showing him what's going, to, what's going to happen. And so when chapter 6 opens up, you begin to see these things. And so let's stand together as we've got the words on the screen. And remember what we said in the very beginning, what John said? He who hears these work, words and says them out loud, will be blessed. And this morning, if you don't get anything out of this, I want you to be blessed just because you've said and read out loud and you've heard the word together, okay? So let's go. Then I, um, got to go back to one, guys. Then I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out as a conqueror in order to conquer. That's the first two verses. Now let's go down to the last three verses, if you would. Uh, Verses 15, uh, well, we'll do 16 because I forgot to put 15 in there. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? You may be seated. One of the things that we fail to realize in in, um, verse number 15 I need to give you that verse because that gives you some uh, other things. And if you've got your Bibles, go with me. But he says in in Revelation chapter 6, verses uh, 15, he said, Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the generals, the rich, the powerful, every slave, every free person, hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. It wasn't just one separate group of people. He's saying that when all of this is being opened up and all of this is being displayed, that what's going to happen is from the lowest of the lowest to the highest of the highest are all going to run to the mountains to try and hide from God. And they're going to find out there is no hiding because he knows in the destruction, in the wrath. Let me say this to you. I was talking with some people, and, and these are my views. I'm not one of these doomsday prophets. I'm not one of these that's going to say in the year 2021 that Jesus is coming back. I don't know if he is, but I know he could. I know he could come back in 2020 if he wanted to, before the end. And we may not even see a new year roll around. And that'd be okay with me, because I'm done. I'm finished. But when you begin to look at what unfolded this year, this pandemic was not on one group of people. This was not on one nation. The recession was not on one country. This was something that happened globally. There was not one country, one spot. It didn't matter whether it was spring, it was winter or summer, spring or fall. It hit. And now they're saying that it's coming back stronger than ever. Numbers of people dying are escalating. The number of people getting it is escalating. 
They're talking about a vaccine. It's not a vaccine, okay? It's a shot. It's all it is. It's a shot to help you gain immunity or that your body will build up immunity to it. That's all it is, okay? So I'll rest that case. But here's what happened. All of a sudden, every freedom that you had was erased. Everything that you did was controlled by an individual. We said we had rights. Really? All of a sudden, you've seen presidents, dictators, leaders of countries telling their people, this is what you're going to do. Curfews were put on everybody. They started telling you you couldn't eat out, even though only 1.3% of the virus was, was contact tracing was from people who had eaten out. You couldn't gather in large events because that would be a super spreader. But yet, you could go out into the streets and protest with no mask on. And you weren't arrested. And if you were arrested for looting and others, you had actual people of a political party that were working to pay the bail to get those people out of jail. And nobody ever has done that before except a few presidents. But you begin to see this whole world turned upside down. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, the mainstream media. If you were to say certain little phrases, you were censored. You could only get the news that they wanted you to get. What does that sound like? It sounds exactly like a dictatorship that we're going to tell you what you want or not what you want, what we want to tell you. Churches were told they couldn't gather. You couldn't come and worship. If you wanted to worship, do it in the parking lot. You had to do this. You had to do that. And now you need to be careful because there was one thing that I got in. I'm not in Facebook jail, okay? But there was one thing that I shared. There was one thing that I shared, which is absolutely valid. It was actually on a website that is absolutely correct and real. Signed by 100 members of Congress of exactly what they want the next president, it's Joe Biden, which appears to be, it's going to be him, who knows. But if it is, here's what we want you to do. We want you to erase in God we trust. We want you to stop teaching certain things in schools. We want you to rearrange the history of the United States to start at this point. We want you to teach these things. And every one of the things that they want you to teach are absolutely contrary to the Bible. And guess what they did to me? They took my content down. But that's okay. And I found out we aren't the only ones at Facebook. And what's happening is right in the middle, at the very beginning of the service, we were playing music. Okay? We have the license to do that through our CCLI license. But what's happening is Facebook says we don't care. We're shutting it down at this point in time, which is right at the beginning, and your, your feed is blocked. 
And if you want to argue, go ahead and send us something, and we'll get back with you in a couple of years. And, it's, and you want to know why? Because churches all of a sudden started putting their services online. And guess what? Some of the bigger churches were reaching a lot of people. I have a friend that goes to a church down in, in uh, Tennessee. Last week, they baptized, I think it was last week, what well, she posted, 86 people they baptized. And while they were baptizing the 80, or while they were baptizing the 85th person, an 86th person gave their life to the Lord. People, ladies and gentlemen, are hungering for the word. And as I've shared about, you know, rediscovering Christmas, what, what has happened is Christians have become so locked up that we don't take the opportunity to share Jesus. Again, people are afraid. You walk up to somebody and you get, you get in very close proximity to them at the grocery store, the doctor's office, or anything else. You can't start a conversation about Jesus because they want you, hold on a minute, I don't want you in my face. Well, hold on, I got my negative COVID-19 test card. <laughs> what if I show you that? Can I speak to you now? It doesn't matter. People don't care. And guess what? People all of a sudden have become like robots and follow exactly what they're being told to do. Now, I'm not saying don't wear a mask. I, you know, when I'm out, I'll wear a mask. Why? Because if I want to shop in Kroger, I have to. If I want to go to Lowe's, I have to. Okay? I'm a type of person, when I go shopping, I want to see what I'm buying. Okay? My wife did all of the Christmas shopping on Amazon. You know? And, and, and here's, here's what I heard. This sure looks different than the picture that I saw on, on there. This sure wasn't as big as the picture. Absolutely. Remember those hamburgers always, how, the, how awesome they looked? That's because they were made out of plaster, people. <laughs> and they were painted to look shiny. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you ain't going to eat none of that stuff. <laughs> you know? And then when you eat it, uh, you know, it's like you go into the restaurant and they say, what would you like? I want a, I want a sandwich just like that that you've got on your menu. And they say, I'm sorry, but I, can't, I don't know how to make one. <laughs> they, they haven't told me exactly what to do. So anyway, we need to understand some things as we come into Revelation chapter, chapter 6. The good thing about this is that I'm going to pick a stopping point and we're going to stop there because there is no way I can get through all of my notes and all of my scriptures that I want to give you today. Okay, and I don't want to shortchange it by skipping through because there's some important things that you need to know about some things that were written in the Bible that are now being portrayed out of the book of Revelation, out of Daniel, and how it all intertwines together. And you'll share some things. When you begin to look Number one, it talks about in, in chapter six, there are, if you remember, there were seven parchments or seven scrolls. And each one of those scrolls had a seal on it. You had the first scroll sealed. The second parchment, and it basically started from the back. And so what happened was the second one sealed the third one was wrapped around the first and two sealed, fourth, same way, all the way through the seventh, okay? And the seventh was the one in the middle. So what happened was they would unseal the first one and, and it would unfold. And what you'll see in Revelation chapter 6 is you'll see the unsealing of these things. Now, there's something very important about these seven seals, Okay? And in actuality, you'll have to find out that 650 years, 
650 years before John got the revelation from Jesus. And I have, the, I have it, I believe, um, it's in the book of Daniel, uh, Mark. It's the next scripture up. And, and here's, what, here's what it said. Remember, there are two angels in the Bible that have names that we know of. One is Gabriel. Gabriel is the one of good news. He's the one at Christmas, you, you know, the, the birth of Christ, uh, to, um, to Zechariah and Elizabeth, or, or to Zechariah, when Gabriel came and announced that they were going to have a, a child named Jesus. There's also another one, Michael. Michael is an, a, an angel of power. And he also has an announcement. And here's what happened. 650 years prior, Michael spoke to Daniel. And here's what he said. He said at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands watch over your people, will rise up. Now look at what he says. There will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. And look at what he said. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the church doesn't go through the tribulation. And this is why I'm not going to argue with these people. If they, want to, if they want to go through it, let them take it up with Jesus. Me and him's already decided I ain't going through it. Actually, he decided, and I, I'm, I'm following right on his coattails. I'm going with what he says. And this is what he said to Daniel 650 years before. Those whose name will be found written in the book. Well, guess what? My name's already written in the book because I gave my life to Jesus a long time ago in 1964. And and contrary to popular belief, as bad as I've been, as disobedient as I've been, as unworthy as I've been, my name's still in the book because it isn't what I do that keeps me in the book. It's what he did that keeps me in the book. So... I'm leaving it up to him. And I'm going to trust him over some other people. They can say whatever they want to. But here's what he says. Verse number two. But many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. I don't have to worry about disgrace or eternal contempt. And so what we need to understand is when you look at the seven seals, the seven seals actually are part of the seven witnesses. And you have to understand something. These seven witnesses were given, were given power to watch over the scrolls. And they've been watching over these scrolls and these scrolls and these scrolls. Jesus is telling John what's going to unfold once he breaks the seal on that first scroll. Here's what's going to unfold. When I break the seal on the second one, here's what's going to unfold. When I break the third one, here's what's going to happen. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. It hasn't been done yet. But when he does, he's giving us a picture here in chapter 6 of what's going to unfold. But you've got to understand something. There are seven witnesses right now that are standing there on guard because what did the Bible say? When they said they saw the scrolls, he said they looked all over heaven, all over the earth, under the earth, under the heaven, everywhere to find someone who was able to break the seal. And they couldn't find anyone but Jesus. So these seven witnesses, whoever they are, I believe angels, whatever, are 
their pack, their, their task right now is, I don't want anybody, anything, anyone, especially Satan, to come in here and break that seal because they're not worthy. The only one worthy to break that seal is Jesus. Only him. And you make sure that's your job. And let me tell you something. When God gives a direct order to an angel, ladies and gentlemen, they have got all of the power of heaven to be able to carry out that order. And there is nothing going to stop them from doing it. So you begin to see this. He, he told him, he said, in, in uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4, he says, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. When the time of the end comes, then the scrolls begin to unroll and unwrap. And we need to understand, what is, what is it going to be? A time of unprecedented global distress. Let me ask you this question. How many of you all have made it through 2020? Anybody here not made it? <laughs> You've made it. Almost. We're almost there. How hard was it? It's been a tough year. But can I tell you something? This is just a glimpse of what the real thing's going to be like. And you think about it, how hard this was for you, and, and we're Christians, most of us I believe are. Think of how hard it was for us. Now think about how hard it's going to be to go through something like this without Jesus. Now you'll understand why he says that they'll be crying for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them. I would rather face death than to face the wrath of God, ladies and gentlemen. This is why it is imperative that I believe that the church more than ever becomes a focal point to the world. We can't let a virus or Satan or, and you may not like this, but you've got to understand something. This could also be from God. And I believe it was. Because you'll find that there are times that God will use certain things to bring judgment upon his people. And I believe that God has brought judgment to the church because the church became lax and lazy. But my question is, how much time? You see, a lot of people today, you, you know, and, and I understand, they're scared. They're afraid. But here's, here's my point, you know, and, 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 and you, you can say you don't like me and, and anything, but that's okay. I'm not you, you're not me, and you ain't never going to be me. My point is this, ladies and gentlemen, I have lived almost 67 years, and I'm ready to go home. Not, not really, but if it happens, it happens. I'm prepared. If I go with COVID or without COVID, I'm going. And I would rather go either way, with COVID or without COVID, working for God. 
knowing that I went out of here working. That's why sometimes, I, I know you guys would freak out, but it's almost like I get this thing of, okay, God, I finished my last sermon. I've given my last invitation. Now take me home. I, I know it would not be nice to you all to do that. I'll wait till y'all go, and I'll, me and I will have an arrangement. You all have cleared the building. <laughs> but that's me. That's what I want B- because I haven't always been this way. But now more than ever, my conversations aren't much. I observe, you know, and, and then I look for a place to where I could say, okay, what can... God, what is it that you want me to say to this person? Not what do I want to say. What do you want me to say? Make my words accurate. Make my words beneficial. Don't make them just ramblings and fillers. Make it there. We we were talking this week, and everybody says, why don't you talk so much? And I said, my talking is done from the pulpit. That's where I do my talking anymore. Ask Linda, ask Diana, ask my family. I am probably one of the most quietest persons you've ever met anymore. Totally different than what I used to be. It used to be I was like a, sibling, a, a, a tinkering symbol. Going. But here's what God told Daniel. And this is what I'm saying. This is going to take a little while to get through all of this. But here's what he said. In Daniel chapter 12, in verse number 9, he says, Go your way, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. And so what he's saying is, okay, Daniel, I've already given you these these seals or, or these scrolls. You've got the word. Here they are. They're scrolled up. Now, Daniel, they're scrolled. They're sealed until the time. You just go on about your business. And may I say this to you, that's exactly what God's telling us. He's saying, listen, everybody is so in, involved in when's it coming and when's it coming and when's it coming. And he's saying, hold on a minute. You don't understand. It's going to come when I want it to come. When it's the end of time and that time, end time has come, then I'm going to unroll these. And until then, you just go about your business and do what it is that I told you to do. And I believe that's what God is giving the church an opportunity to do right now, is to get up and go about your business. Don't sit in fear and afraid about this or about that. What fear we ought to be thinking about is, God, who is it out there that's lost that's going to be calling for the rocks to fall upon them, that God, if I could go and just share a message that you've got, that we could talk to that person, and that person could, could come uh, you know, from, from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit working with them, and God, we could save them from that. Or you can save them. You, you know, I'm not saving them. You can save them. But this is what we need to be praying. Instead of, God, I'm going to go to Kroger's today. Please don't let me run into somebody that's got COVID because I don't know what's going to happen if I get it. It's like I'm getting in my car. I'm doing this, and our prayers are, God, just get me home safely. Instead of saying, God, I don't care how I get home, when I get home, but God, who is it that you want me to talk to right now? Why are you pointing me in that direction? Why am I going here? Because everything from God, ladies and gentlemen, is not an accident. I have told you that everything that we do, ladies and gentlemen, are by divine appointments. And we've got to figure out what appointment we're keeping and quit canceling them. If you want to cancel a doctor's appointment, cancel it. But you better not cancel an appointment with God. That's not good. That can get you into a lot of trouble. Uh, He doesn't charge your insurance company. He charges your slate (laughs) that says, here, I had a blessing for you. Guess what? You just lost it because you didn't do what I asked you to do. I got to give that to somebody else and have somebody else do that. So when we begin to look at all of these things, we begin to look at, and, and chapter number five, right previously here, it's really talking about the lion and the lamb, 
about Jesus. And what did he do as we just finished up with the Advent talking of the coming? The coming, the coming. Well, we just finished with the Advent of Christmas Day. But ladies and gentlemen, the biggest Advent has not happened yet. And the biggest Advent is when Jesus comes back to get his bride, his church, to get us out of this mess. And he says that when you begin to look at this, it it was one thing, and that was this. When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them an inheritance. He said, I've created this perfectly. Here's all I want you to do is take care of it for me. And what did they do? They blew it. The inheritance that God gave them, they forfeited. And so what did God do? God still wanted to give man that inheritance. So what did he do? He sent Jesus, our Redeemer. And guess what? That Jesus that came as a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger on that day, he came to give us that way to inherit that or gain back that inheritance that God wanted to give us. So guess what? One of these days, ladies and gentlemen, in these seven scrolls we talked about it, is God's last will and testament. And it's going to be read. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here's what's going to happen. For those of you that disobey me, here's, here's, here's what I'm giving you. Here's what I'm leaving you. But for those who are faithful, guess what? You don't have to go through this. And at the end of it all, you get to come and be seated with the marriage of the Lamb, the the supper that God himself is preparing, waiting. He's going to be the one to officiate the biggest marriage in all of history. And it, you, talk about a, you talk about going all out. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but I think God's going all out. If he can take and create all of this, what in the world can he do with cooking up a meal? I know one thing. I don't like broccoli, and I don't like Brussels sprouts, and I'm hoping that's not on the menu but if it is, I'll eat it. Cool. <laughs> Sit close. If not, we'll just throw because it'll, it'll be clean. But when you begin to look at this, he talks about the seven seals and how they were not going to be open until that time. And so when you look at Revelation chapter 6, you need to understand something. Revelation chapter 6, ladies and gentlemen, is a wake-up call. And it's a wake-up call, can I tell you, for everybody, not just the lost. It's a wake-up call for even the children of God, as we already started talking. It's a wake-up call, why? Because we, we were tasked with a job to do. What was it that Jesus said to his disciples? He says, I'm going away, but I'm going to pray to the Father, that he will send another comforter, someone to be with you. So when you get in trouble, you, you, you're, you're in the day that I know that you're going to, Satan is going to come all against you, and there's going to be times that you're going to be afraid. There's going to be times that you're going to be disappointing. There's times that all these things are going to happen. But I'm always going to be there. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going to be there. And as long as I'm with you, he said, even until the end of the age. So what did God do? He sent his Holy Spirit. So here's the wake-up call. The wake-up call is not only to the lost people, that here's what's going to happen when Jesus is coming. The wake-up call is to us to go be able to warn people about these things that are going to happen. Because let me say this thing to you. How many of you as parents have told your children, don't do that? And they turn right around and did it again. Or how many times did you, as a child, your parents told you, don't do that, and what did you do? You did it. They they told you, don't do that, you did it. But there came a point in time when your parents 
lost their patience. Now, I don't know what happened with you when your parents lost their patience, but I know what happened with me when my parents lost their patience. It only happened once or twice. Because I was smart enough to know you don't test the patience of your mom and dad. Because once it hits that, that governor <laughs> on the patient scale and it starts tipping, honey, something's going to happen. Mine was, my, my mom, whenever she ran out of patience, she began throwing dishes. And I, I, that's why I said we never, ever had a complete set of dishes in, my, in our house. You know. But she never hit anybody with them. It was just we had really nice broken spots on the walls. But back then it was plaster, you, you know. It wasn't this drywall stuff, so it would happen. So anyway, here's what's happening. And may I say this to you all. I believe that God has been very patient with us. But I think that God's almost got to his limit. Because he said that in that time, that man would be lovers of himself more than lovers of God. They did a survey of young people under the age of 30. And they asked them, what religious affiliation do you have? 80% of the people that they, that they surveyed came back with none. None. The survey that was done by uh, Ed Stetzler and a couple other people, they did a survey and they said that not in the generation of, of, of my children but the gen- or the generation of my grandchildren, but the generation of my great-grandchildren, if God doesn't come back, only 4% of those people would have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, but I don't think that God's going to ever let it get to 96% of the world not having a relationship with him because I believe he's going to come before then and we're seeing it unfold in all of the things. So what, so what did we see? In, in, uh, in Genesis or Revelation chapter 6, he said he saw, he saw this seal. He heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. And when you remember, uh, it was one of the high-ranking cherubims, which uh, actually represent worship uh, from the creation of God, where in, if you go back into Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 and 8, where it describes these cherubims, they were covered, they, were, they had their wings, and they were covered with eyes, being able to see everything, everywhere. They had six wings. They were a living creature. And what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to serve God with watchfulness and swiftness. They had, they had six wings to be able to maneuver very quickly. And it was swift with everything that was going on. He, he said, and each of them were living creatures, just as like the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. Each one of them had a very unique appearance out of Revelation chapter 4 in verse number 7. And it's also, if you remember, the living creatures resp- respond to the breaking of the seals. Why? Because the first one was like a lion. And when he, what did he say? When the first one broke it, he said, I heard with a voice like thunder. When a lion roars, it's like thunder. And so when you begin to start looking at, at everything that's going on in the first, first four chapters and now coming into chapter six as everything begins to unfold, you begin to start tying all of this stuff together and figuring out, okay, what are you saying? And he says that he was coming on a white horse and, and we understand, okay, Jesus is going, it's coming on a white horse, but I don't think this is Jesus in this because, this because Jesus is not both the one who breaks the seal on the scroll and then comes, 
Okay, so it, it's somebody's going to be the one to deliver the judgment that is there. And so when you look at this in, in um, chapter 6, you also see that the, that the writer there in the introduction is holding a bow, but no arrow. He's only got a bow. And sometimes, Why? Because when you begin to look at it and you think about it, as he opens the first one, it's not a complete conquest. It's only a partial one. And so he's only going to do certain things with the opening of the first seal. Eventually, all of it is going to come to a a complete conquest, and that's when the real champion riding on the white horse, is coming for destruction. That's Jesus. But in this point, you've got one that's riding on a white horse, coming to do a conquest, but just a partial one. Because he's not destroying everything in the first seal. Okay, And you'll also find that it says that that Jesus comes with a sharp sword in which to strike down the nations. And in Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 15, it says that he he will rule them with an iron scepter. But yet this one, this writer, was given a crown. But when you read about Jesus coming on the horse, he said he had many crowns. So there's a difference here between Jesus and who is coming, the one that's going to come to do the execution here. I've got a clock up here, and so this, I'm going to get through part of a point. So we may be here for about six weeks doing this, okay? <laughs> but there's some other things about this to, to help you to understand. This is not Jesus coming at this point. So don't let people tell you this is the second coming of Jesus. This is not the second coming of Jesus. He is not setting foot on the earth at this point in time. He is sending, he, God sending out one of, of his workers that he wants because there's a difference. When you read in Revelation chapter 6 about the crown that this writer is going to have, this crown in the, in the Greek, it is, it is Stephanos, which is S-T-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. And that Stephanos is a wreath of victory which quickly wilts away. So the word that he used here in the crown, very specific, Okay, and that's why sometimes you've got to go back and get the original language. But you need to understand that what it says about Jesus when, it, when he wears a crown, every place in the Bible where it talks about Jesus wearing a crown, we have got this in the Christmas carols that we have. He has a royal diadem. The word for the crown of Jesus in the Greek, in the original language, is called a diadem. That's why we sing that word in the Christmas carols, because a diadem is a crown that never goes away. It is eternal. So let me say this to you. The crown that you and I are going to get, ladies and gentlemen, is not a Stephanos. It is not a temporary crown that's going to wilt away. We are getting a crown just like Jesus. When we get a crown, the crown or crowns that we get, when we get to heaven, it is going to be a diadem. And guess what? It is going to be a royal diadem because you and I are going to be part of the greatest royal family ever, ever. And that is the family of God. By the way, we lose our last name. And may I say this to you all, everything will be wiped away and everything underneath of it is just as Jonathan had painted. It's all going to be gold out of there. And guess what? I'll finish. Man, I, I didn't get very far. You have to listen to this for the next six weeks. <laughs> 
But when you, when you look at the, the writer, and, and let me just finish this part, and, and, and I will stop, okay? Let me just get finished with this. This writer is accompanied by three other writers, and they are going to bring nothing but death and destruction, okay? Now, you've got to understand that Jesus is one writer, and he is seen riding with the armies of heaven, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. If you go later on in, in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 14, the writer's head is contrasted with the three other ones in different colors. Those who ride with Jesus, let me say to you this, we're all coming on one white, we're all going to have white horses. There ain't going to be no black, red, purple, palominos, pintos, or any of that stuff. They're all going to be white, okay? Every one of them. And it's, that's in Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 14. This writer here has no name, but Jesus carries the name. If you go into Revelation chapter 19, verses 11, 13, and 16, he is called faithful and true, the word of God, king of kings, and lord of lords. The writer on this, this uh, horse in chapter 6 is a representative of the world's lust for control and rule by force. Guess what's happening right now? They will do anything and everything to get elected. It is a lust for power. You get people all the time saying, I'm running, I'm running for office because I want to get all of this stuff out of there. I'm going to make it all clean. And guess what happens? They get sucked in, and next thing you know, they become part of a problem, not a solution to there. And the ones, the ones that find out about this, they leave. The ones that, that find out, they're basically in there one or two terms, and they're gone because they find out, I, I come in here to make a change, but I can't do this by myself, and I can't get anybody with me because all these others are so entrenched with everything. And so... I'm not saying that all politicians are crooked. I'm just saying that 99.9 of them are. The only one's honest is the city dog catcher. Okay, but anyway, here, here's what we got. It said that this writer, uh, Paul actually t- tells us about this, or Daniel called him the prince that, sh- prince that shall come, and we need to understand these things. John uh, calls them an antichrist. In 1 John chapter 4, verse number 3, he calls them the beast in Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 1. That will be the final dictator. The final dictator. Now, a lot of people say, is that person already here? They could be. They could be. We don't know. Some people have always said, well, this person, that person, that person. And most of those people are dead by now, so it's not. But in Revelation chapter uh, 13 and verse number 1, it says the beast is coming out of the sea. He is sent by Satan. In 13 chapter 2, the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. So what's that saying? Let me say this to you all real quick. You're, you're going to hear a whole lot, a whole lot about this and that and the other. And, and so we're, we'll finish with this. You're going to hear a lot of people say, Joe Biden is the Antichrist. There ain't no way. And the reason for that is this. The U.S., I believe, does not have the power of the individual to be able to conquer the rest of the world. Why? Because we're owned by too many other people. Our secrets are stolen by one country. And this this is what you need to be careful about. China made an edict, a law, that said by 2025, we are going to rule the world. We will own all commerce. We will own all banks. We will own all technology. So when in America, when you you produce something and you sell it to China, you have to sell them your secrets or they'll steal them. In America today, right now, there's over 300,000, they believe, agents that guess where they're at? In the colleges. They're everywhere. 
You've read it in the paper the last time. Um, you know, let's just give it to you. Um, Diane Feinstein had a, a, a um, chief of staff who was actually a ties to China that was on her staff for 14 years. Uh, Eric Swalwell, who was just uh, caught with a uh, relationship and was put on the, um, oh man, the intelligence committee, which has all of the secrets of the American warfare and the things that we're building and the things that we're doing. And guess where they're going? Right back to China. China, call it whatever you want to, when all of this struck, China was the maker of all of the PPE stuff. They were makers of all of the masks. And guess what they did? When it got struck, they wouldn't sell any to the United States. The United States had, had no way to get them. And if you wanted to, and they were selling them to other people at the highest bidder. We had to come and make our own. I believe that God had a president, because God does what God does, to be here at a moment in time to be able to take care of some certain things so that we would not be privy or, or basically a, a, a product or a slavery to them. But may I say this to you all? This is why I believe it's not going to be long. Not long at all. Your iPhones, you know, my iPhone, your iPhone, most of them are made in China. Your um, Android phones, a lot of those are made in China. We have no idea what's going into these things, guys. We already know that they're keeping track of everything that you own. And do you know that there's basically 11 people in the world, 11 rich people in the world that are basically controlling all policies and everything that's going on right now? They're the owners of Facebook, uh, YouTube, all social media, because where's everybody putting all their stuff? YouTube, social media. Where's everybody getting their news? And so this is why I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, it is time that we in America wake up because we don't have much time. Again, I'm not a doomsday. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to be. Only God does. But here's what I'm saying. It is time to wake up, get out of here, and go tell people about Jesus. It's happening. We got fear of 2020. I think we got to get enthusiastic about 2021. And quit focusing on the negative stuff and the positive stuff says, hey, I'm looking for Jesus to come. If I wake up tomorrow, I'm looking for him to come. If you guy get up the next day, I'm looking for him to come. If I get up the next day, I'm looking for him to come. Every day I'm gonna get up. Hey, is this the day? Let's go to work. Let's go to work because I want to find, I want God to find me working when he comes. 